Fishermen are very well known for telling tall tales of epic and perilous battles against gigantic sea monsters. Creatures of myth like the Kraken, Leviathan, Yormagondor, Charybdis, and so many other examples can be found in stories from around the world throughout history. While we have no direct evidence that any of these monsters actually existed, we only need to look to our current oceans to find some real giants. Call me Jeremy Wade, cause it's time to catch a monster. On today's episode of Endangered Inhabitants, we'll be swimming into the world of Makaira Nigricans, the Blue Marlin. When talking about quote-unquote fish, there are three main groups within the infraphylum Gnathostomata, or the jawed vertebrates, two of which were already covered in this series. The class Chondrichthys, the cartilaginous fish, is the odd one out as it isn't a subdivision of the class Osteichthys, the bony fish. Osteichthys can further be divided into two subclasses, the Sarcopterygii containing the lobe-finned fish, and the Actinorygii containing the ray-finned fish, which our marlin falls under. As someone who tried to sort out the different families of Actinoterygii for a scrapped video idea, this is extremely convoluted and often subject to change, so this may become dated compared to some other species covered in the series, but we press on. These fish are found in the division Teleostai, which is by far the largest group of ray-finned fish, containing 96% of all extant fish species. They're then found in the clade Percomorpha, yet another gigantic grouping of ray-finned fish with over 17,000 species. There are so many groupings I gotta rattle off because I'm cursed with wanting these to be as detailed as possible without alienating more casual viewers, so we're going to do a bit of speed running right now until we get down to their superfamily. Marlins and their relatives can be found in the subseries Carangaria, the order Carangiforms, and the suborder Menidae. Marlins are billfish, part of the superfamily Ziphidea, characterized by their snoots, which we'll get into later. This grouping can further be divided into two families, the Ziphiidae, containing just the swordfish, and the Istiophoridae, which contains the sailfish, spearfish, and marlins. Istiophoridae can further be divided into five genera, Istiompax, containing just the black marlin, Istiophorus, containing two species of sailfish, Kajikia, containing two other species of marlin, Tetrateris, containing four species of spearfish, and Makaira, containing the blue marlin. Like another species covered in this series, it was thought that Makaira only contained one species, that being Makaira nigricans. This was thought to have been the case from the recognition of the species back in 1802 by this feller, until 1901 when these two named Makaira mazara, the Indo-Pacific blue marlin. These two, if they aren't one species, are closely related, making their classification under much debate on whether they're separate species. While genetic evidence suggests that the two groups are mostly isolated from each other, they may be the same species, with the only genetic exchange occurring when Indo-Pacific individuals migrate and contribute genes to the Atlantic population, and vice versa. For this episode, we will recognize one species as evidence is mounting that this is a monotypic genus, a genus containing only one species. These guys are the largest of all the billfish. All of the largest blue marlin ever caught are actually female, yes, queen. with the females being around four times the size of the much smaller males. Males can reach lengths of around 2.1 meters, or 7 feet, and weigh 91 to 181 kilograms, or 200 to 400 pounds, but rarely exceed 159 kilograms, or 350 pounds. Females, on the other hand, can grow anywhere between 3.3 to 4.8 meters or 11 to 16 feet long and weigh anywhere between 454 to 816 kilograms or 1,000 to 1,800 pounds. These fish typically live around 10 years, but can live up to 30 under ideal living conditions, with females generally outliving males by up to a decade. As with all billfish, these fish are built for speed and power. Their sleek, streamlined bodies are perfectly designed to minimize drag and maximize their swimming efficiency. 
One of the most striking features all billfish possess, which give them their name, is the long spear-shaped bill which can also be called a snout, beak, or rostrum depending on who you ask. Rather than being a big ol' schnoz as one would assume, it is actually an extension of the premaxillary bone of the upper jaw, being composed of a hard bone. Speaking of bones, marlin skeletons are dominated by the axial or central skeleton, including the vertebral column, ribs, and fins. They sport two dorsal fins, one of which is tall and sail-like, and two anal fins that help in stability while chasing prey. They also sport pectoral fins on their sides, pelvic fins in front of their anal fins, and caudal fins that make up their tail. These fins are supported by bony spines known as rays, hence the name ray-finned fish referenced earlier. They can actually fold their first anal, pectoral, and caudal fins into grooves, further streamlining the fish and reducing drag. While nearly all fish are exclusively cold-blooded, billfish are different. They possess specialized blood vessels, called countercurrent exchangers, that allow them to warm targeted parts of the body, primarily their brain and those massive peepers. This fascinating physiological ability enhances their vision and thinking ability to provide these hunters a huge advantage over prey. Speaking of senses, blue marlin, like all other fish, possess a lateral line, a network of interconnecting canals that act as a hydrodynamic receptor enabling them to sense low-frequency water movements and pressure changes, especially in close quarters. These bodies are covered in thick, bony, elongated scales that cover pigment-containing iridophores and light-reflecting skin cells that allow billfish to rapidly change color, although not to the same extent as, say, an octopus. Normally, the body is bluish-black on top with a silvery-white underside. This outfit is called countershading, a form of camouflage that a lot of marine megafauna employ to both hide from prey and potential predators. When viewed from above, the dark skin on the back blends in with the ocean's shadowy depths. When viewed from below, the pale underside matches the lighter water near the surface. This allows for the animals to be at least a little bit hidden no matter where they are in the water column. These fish are endemic to the tropical and subtropical waters of the Atlantic, Indian, and Pacific Oceans. They can be found in the waters of many countries including... Uh, oh god. So, change of plans. We'll be going through each ocean individually so my lungs don't shrivel into dust before this recording is finished. Starting in the Atlantic, they can be found in the waters of Canada, the United States, Mexico, the Bahamas, Cuba, Belize, Guatemala, Honduras, Jamaica, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Panama, Colombia, Venezuela, Haiti, the Dominican Republic, St. Kitts and Nevis, Antigua and Barbuda, Dominica, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Grenada, Barbados, Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana, Suriname, Brazil, Portugal, Spain, Morocco, Mauritania, Cabo Verde, Senegal, The Gambia, Guinea-Bissau, Guinea, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Côte d'Ivoire, Ghana, Togo, Benin, Nigeria, Sao Tome and Principal, Cameroon, Equatorial Guinea, Gabon, Republic of Congo, Angola, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Uruguay, Argentina, Namibia, and South Africa. In the Indian Ocean, they can be found in South Africa again, Mozambique, Madagascar, Comoros, Mauritius, Seychelles, Tanzania, Kenya, Somalia, Yemen, Oman, Pakistan, India, the Maldives, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Indonesia, and Australia. And finally, in the Pacific, they can be found in Japan, South Korea, China, Taiwan, the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, Palau, Papua New Guinea, the Solomon Islands, Kiribati, Fiji, the Marshall Islands, Micronesia, Tonga, Tuvalu, Vanuatu, Samoa, New Zealand, the United States, Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, Panama, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Mexico. These are so-called blue water fish, spending most of their lives far out at sea, rarely being found anywhere near shore. They prefer warm waters that are well mixed by surface winds and are uniform in temperature and salinity, with blue marlin being considered the most tropical of all the billfish. 
They are highly migratory, with their range expanding north and south in the warmer months into both hemispheres and contracting towards the equator during colder months as they follow the warm ocean currents for hundreds and even thousands of miles. The largest numbers are usually found in waters warmer than 24 degrees Celsius or 75 degrees Fahrenheit, but have been found at surface water temperatures as high as 30 degrees Celsius or 87 degrees Fahrenheit and as low as 22 degrees Celsius or 71 degrees Fahrenheit. When talking about marine animals, especially open water ones, you have to remember that there is another dimension to consider when talking about habitat, that being depth. Blue marlin prefer the warmer waters of the epipelagic zone, the illuminated zone at the surface of the sea with sufficient light for photosynthesis. They will also routinely dive to depths of 400 to 600 meters or 1,300 to 1,900 feet into the mesopelagic or twilight zone in search of food in some populations. Adult blue marlins are aggressive carnivores, being the bigger fish in that one saying about there always being a bigger fish. They will feed on a variety of fishes as they continue to grow, being particular fans of scombrids like tuna and mackerel, squid, and juvenile inshore fish whenever near oceanic islands and coral reefs. Smaller species taken near the surface include frigate mackerel, bullet tuna, and skipjack tuna. When diving into the mesopelagic zone, species targeted include various squid, various pomfret, and the snake mackerel. When fully grown, they are able to take prey as large as white marlin, yellowfin tuna, common dolphinfish, and big eye tuna up to 45 kilograms or 100 pounds in weight. Conversely, they can also feed on small but numerous prey such as filefish and snipefish when available. They are among the fastest fish in the ocean, even at their large size, using their bill to slash through schools of prey, returning to eat any stunned or wounded victims. Whenever they get close to a school of prey, they will rapidly move their bill from side to side, hopefully stunning the target before quickly swimming back around to catch and swallow their victim whole. Blue marlins are generally solitary, especially the larger individuals, which don't benefit as much from the perks that living in a school provide as they don't really need the protection from predators, already have the ocular equipment to seek out food on their own, are able to travel vast distances in search of mates, and don't need other individuals to help them slip through the water while using less energy as they have the body plan of a torpedo. Although smaller specimens, like the beta males, can sometimes be found in small schools. Speaking of those vast distances they travel, blue marlin are highly migratory, as previously mentioned. Individuals are known to travel thousands of miles, even across ocean basins and even the entire oceans themselves as they follow warm ocean currents. These animals are diurnal, being most active during the day. While they spend most of their time in the first few meters of the water column, they perform dial vertical movement patterns during the day, oscillating between surface and deeper water. As sight hunters, marlin depend on those orbs to spot prey, so they have to absorb as much light as possible when diving into the murky midnight zone. They spend the night near the surface, with their activity levels being generally low. When breeding time nears, the season of which depends on the location and population, blue marlins will tend to gather in schools as they prepare. Most ray-finned fish breed through a process called broadcast spawning, marlin included. This is a form of external fertilization where females release up to 7 million unfertilized eggs into the water, followed by the males releasing their sperm. This creates a giant cloud of nasty, with millions of eggs increasing the chances of fertilization and general survival. Remember that the next time you go into the ocean, which is basically a giant liquid fish orgy. The fertilized eggs are then left in the current, with these babies receiving no parental care. They, along with the itty bitty larvae that hatch from them, are planktonic, free floating in the water column and going wherever the current takes them, being unable to fight it. This continues until the fish grow much larger, which doesn't take long as these babies can grow up to 16 millimeters or 0.63 inches in a single day off a diet of plankton. They are quickly able to take their own destiny into their ha hands? Uh, fins, reaching sexual maturity at between 2 to 4 years old when they reach a certain size. 
This is extremely rare, however, with baby blues having a very low likelihood of making it to adulthood. Adult female blue marlin have a rare combination of size and speed that make them immune from predation in most cases. Only the largest and fastest oceanic predators can target them, chief among them being two species of oceanic shark, the great white and shortfin mako. While much less common, orca and other large pelagic sharks might and are able to hunt adult blues. Their eggs and larvae are the complete opposite, being considered plankton, which are on the second, or third if you include the sun, lowest tier of the aquatic food chain. Any tropical open ocean filter feeder has probably dined on blue marlin babies. Whale sharks see these on the menu and pull out the fine china, baby! Blue marlin are listed as vulnerable on the IUCN red list. The population of mature individuals is currently unknown, as this is a common trend among deep water marine animals, but the population trend is decreasing. Populations are estimated to have declined between 33-37% to 37 over the past three decades across their range. Unlike every other species covered in this series that have an array of threats from various sources, the biggest and only threat that blue marlin face currently is overfishing and the harvesting of aquatic resources, both intentionally and unintentionally. While not a primary target in many commercial fisheries, blue marlin are often caught as bycatch, being accidentally caught by fisheries using long lines that target other species like tuna and swordfish. Any animals caught that aren't the target species either drown or are discarded, often already being dead or dying. The blue marlin is a sport fisherman's dream, but this in itself can cause problems. While they are typically released alive, recent data suggests that released individuals may frequently die after the fact as a result of the intense fight and any bodily trauma that it may have caused. While it is unknown how much of an effect this has on the population, this could represent a significant source of mortality in several coastal areas. While these giants fill us with the same reverence and awe that the sea monsters of legend once did, we need to start treating them with the same amount of respect. These are powerful predators that hold an important role in our oceans, which also deserve way more respect seeing as we depend on them for survival in many ways. As these are the fish that inspired Ernest Hemingway, I hope that they can also help you develop a new level of love for the oceans on this blue planet. I would like to thank each and every one of you for watching. I hope you enjoyed and learned something new. Make sure you hit like, subscribe, and leave a comment with any thoughts or queries down below if you enjoyed this garbage. This video took an ungodly amount of time, but I hope you enjoyed the final product. I am hoping to speed up production of these considerably along with making more videos like my previous one that take deeper dives into pressing issues revolving around biology, ecology, and conservation. Leave any issues you would like me to cover in the comments below. Don't leave suggestions for threatened species yet, though. I've got a list and I'm sticking with it. Hopefully everything will be coming to an end soon. And if that's true, this will be a good legacy I'm leaving behind, at least for my standards, as a complete failure. Everyone have a great day. Peace!